Good morning. It's delightful to uh, greet you this morning. I wish I could see you, but uh, we'll talk about that. Maybe I'll get some more chance to do that soon. Uh, greetings from the people who are here and worshiping in a distanced way. Um, and um, I have a few announcements as we begin. And the first is that this morning we're going to be celebrating communion together. And so if you haven't already, we encourage you to scrounge up some supplies that you would need uh, to participate with that later in the service. Um, also, um, the Building and Grounds Committee is uh, having a work party on Saturday, September 19th. So that is this coming Saturday from noon to four. And they'll be doing various things outside from garden work to some painting to helping clean moss off a roof, I believe, uh, things like that. If you are keen to help with anything uh, like that, um, they would love your help. And uh, if you're willing to help, the best thing to do is let the church office know or to let Jason Rancourt know. Um, but if you don't let us know, you can still show up and help. So that's from noon to four uh, this coming Saturday. But the big news that I was teasing you with last week is that uh, Sunday morning worship here at Elk Lake Baptist Church, our building that is, will be starting up again this coming Sunday, September 20th, at 10.30 a.m. Uh, it will happen by having three distinct groups. So there will be the children will be dropped off and gather um, in the lower building uh, at our Emmanuel Center. Uh, parents, I'm pretty sure you know where that is because that's where they go normally. Um, uh, but they'll be dropped off right away. The youth will have a time in the fellowship hall. And... Everyone else who worships will be in the sanctuary. And, um, and also, um, yeah, you will get more details about the ways that we're going to, all the safety procedures that we're going to do, and that kind of thing to, to worship safely together. But there will be uh, live music. There will be a lot of these things uh, that will be missing, prayers of the community together all that kind of stuff, and we would love uh, for you to consider joining us um, starting next Sunday. Um, now, for those of you, I know there's quite a number of you who uh, that's just not an option for you, and I just want to ensure you that the video that you're used to having on Sunday mornings will continue. Um, we're still going to be taping that in advance, and you'll receive it just like you were before. Um, the one thing that will change for you is that if you were tuning in to the 11.45 a.m., Zoom prayers of the community, um, that will actually be stopping because we can't maintain doing Sundays and that at the same time, unfortunately. Um, but you will have the worship video, and we'd love to see you on a Sunday if you choose to come in the next couple weeks. So uh, look for the details coming by email uh, this Wednesday. If you do not get an email from us by Wednesday and you want to come, please be sure to send an email to the church office and we will make sure that we respond to you. Um, we do uh, want you to have, we want to know that um, you're interested in coming, if you want to come. All right. With that all said, uh, I'm going to um, open us with our call to worship for this morning. And it comes uh, from Psalm 19. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, the God has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuits the other. Nothing is hidden from its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey. Then honey from the comb, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Who can, who can discern their own errors? Forgive our hidden faults. 
Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and redeemer. Would you please bow in prayer with me? Heavenly Father, we do delight in the words that you give us and the messages that you send to us and the guidance that we receive from you. And Heavenly Father, it is our desire that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart would be pleasing in your sight. And so, Heavenly Father, this morning we pray that you would soften us before you, that we might be able to hear your voice through your word, and that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we may be shaped greater into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, the one whose words and whose heart truly do reflect what is pleasing in your sight. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we are going to sing our opening hymn, which is hymn number 63, All Creatures of Our God and King. So number 63. Would you please stand with me as we sing?
Would you please bow in prayer with me? God of righteousness and justice, you have established the way of life in which we should walk, and it is against you that we have sinned. You alone have power to pardon, and you have offered to us forgiveness through Jesus Christ, your Son. Be pleased, therefore, once more to forgive our sin and remove our guilt. In turn, grant to us the wisdom to know your will, the willingness to walk in its way, and the power to achieve your purposes. Through Christ our Redeemer. Amen. In Psalm 103, we are reminded that the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Therefore, may all who have faith in the Jesus Christ be assured of their forgiveness upon the trustworthiness of God's word. Amen. At this time, I invite you to continue to worship in song. Uh, in the video you're watching just below, you'll see a link to some worship songs. Uh, if you have kids with you, there's also a link to the kids' song. I invite you to worship in song, and when you come back, uh, we'll continue. Feel free to pause the video at this point, I should say, <laughs> and then we'll see you. Welcome back. It's now time for the prayers of our community, and at this time I will open in prayer and offer a few thanksgivings and requests to the Lord, and then uh, I will give a moment of pause in the middle where you can again pause your video at home and um, lift up your prayers and petitions to God, uh, wherever you may be, and then when you're finished you can unpause and I will close in prayer. So would you now bow in prayer with me? Gracious God, we come to you, well, firstly, because we have nowhere else to go. We confess that there is no other name in which we can be saved than in the name of Jesus Christ who died for us. And so, Father, we come to you, and we thank you for giving us the gift of your salvation, which was won for us by Jesus' death on the cross. And in thankfulness for this, we give you thanks for the uh, gift that comes out of this, the gift of church, the gift that you have not just called one or two people, but that you've called many people and have brought them together in one family that stretches all across the globe, throughout time and on into eternity. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us who are living in this place and in this time as part of your church to find ways to love each other and care for each other and have fellowship with each other in spite of whatever restrictions or other things that might seem to be in the way. And Lord, we also want to give up uh, our requests uh, as we think also of the union that happens between husband and wife. And Father, this weekend we um, lift up to you Martin and Laura Lynn, who will be getting married this coming Saturday. We pray that you would unite them in love and that the love that is shared between them would be the blessing that overflows to bless parents and family, and in your good time, if your will, is uh, children as well. We thank you for the gift of marriage, and we pray that you would honor it in their lives. And Lord, we also now lift up our own thanksgivings and requests to you in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can trust you, that you are easily strong enough and great enough to guide all of humankind toward the glorious end that you have planned in Jesus Christ, the new heavens and the new earth. And Father, in the meantime, you have given us the gift of your Holy Spirit as a comforter and a guide. 
And you have given us, given us your word, uh, the word that speaks of your son, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we ask that by these things you would guide us and comfort us and give us hope that the world does not have. Hope that allows us to live with the grace and kindness and love that you have first shown to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you have kids with you at this time, I encourage you to start up their lesson time. Um, uh, and right now, I'd like to invite Greg to come on up and read scripture for us. The scripture reading this morning is Romans chapter 5. So I invite you to follow along. Actually, I want to encourage you to follow along, whether you're here in the sanctuary of the church or in the sanctuary of your own home. This is an opportunity to uh, listen carefully to one of those chapters that starts with the word therefore. So if we read carefully, we'll start to discover what the therefore is there for. Okay. Reading uh, Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved through God's wrath through him? For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, <clears throat> shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned, for before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many, Again, this gift of God was not like the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, 
Just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. The law was added so that the trespass might increase. But where sin is increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through the righteousness that bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Would you please bow in prayer with me? Lord, we come to you, and at this time we especially ask that you'd have mercy on us in opening our minds to hear and understand your word, and that you would give us the great, great grace of your Holy Spirit to affirm these words in our hearts so that we might understand the truth of your love for us in a far deeper way than we did before. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Bad news is not something we can simply ignore, right? It's not just enough if something bad happens to put on a smiley face. Bad news, whether it is loss or oppression or even death itself, needs to be addressed and overcome by good news. And we have been listening to the word of God given to us through Paul's letter to the Romans to hear this good news, a good news that really can set us free from the tyranny of the bad news that surrounds us. And we have learned from Paul that the good news from God, the good news that has the power to deliver us from all our bad news, finds its source in God's gracious act of sending Jesus Christ to die for us. And this is because the real bad news that lies at the root of all our other bad news is that all of humankind has contributed to the ruining of God's good world by committing idolatry. That is, by exchanging the truth about God for a lie and then living according to that lie. That's what's messing up the world. In other words, by doing so, all of humankind ended up on the wrong side of God's protective love his zealous care for the goodness of his creation, or as the Bible likes to put it in one word, his wrath. Wrath, the wrath of God, that is, is expressed not just in the future at final judgment, but Paul tells us it is actually expressed in the present by God's handing us over to the consequences of our idolatry, of our trying to live our lives without reference to the living God. This, then, Paul is saying, is where all our other bad news comes from. But the good news is that God himself, in the person of Jesus Christ, has propitiated, that is, he has absorbed the consequences of the wrath that we deserved into himself. Therefore, through the death of Jesus, God won the right to justly do what he has always longed to do from the very time that Adam and Eve first sinned in the garden. And that is to justify everyone who believes in him freely, by grace, not by works. Because of what Jesus has done, God is now free. And he takes advantage of this freedom to give everyone who believes this dignity, to take them out from being on the wrong side of his protective love and bring them in to the inside of his protective love. This is what justification does. It declares righteous, that is, worthy of protection, those who were previously condemned, who were previously worthy of destruction. And this justification by God's grace through faith in Jesus is the bedrock of the good news from God. But having now established this foundation of the good news from God, Paul, starting in chapter 5, which was read to us this morning, launches into unpacking how this justification leads to much more good news than we could ever naturally expect to receive. 
Jesus' death is enough, yes, to dress all the bad news of the world, praise the Lord, but it is also much more than enough. In fact, this is Paul's repeated, repeated cry throughout chapter 5. In verse 9, he cries out, how much more? In verse 10, he says, how much more? In verse 15, he writes, how much more? In verse 17, he says, how much more? And he caps it all off in verse 20 with his cry, all the more. <laughs> this is the chapter where Paul begins to tell us and powerfully assure us that the good news from God is so much more than we often think it is. Yes, the good news is the message of salvation from all of our bad news. But Paul, and Paul establishes this in Romans chapter 1 through 4. But his point now is that God's good news is about much more than just swallowing up the bad news, than just fixing the brokenness. Justification does more than propitiate, than just placate God's wrath. That's the beginning, the foundation of the mansion of God's glorious good news. But there is more good news, he's saying. So then, what is it? What is the how much more that comes with being justified by faith in Jesus Christ? Well, Paul starts telling us right away in verse 1 of chapter 5, where he writes this. He says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justification brings us peace with God. Notice that Paul does not say peace of God. Paul is not talking about the gift of feeling peace inside of us, that is, emotional peace. Paul does assure us in other places, for example, in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, that believers do also receive this kind of peace, the peace of God, where he writes, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So we get that too. I'm not saying we don't get that. But here in Romans 5, verse 1, Paul is talking about having peace with God. In other words, apart from the justification freely given to us when we believe in Jesus, people are not at peace with God. We are not on good terms with him. Now, God loves all people, but apart from justi justification, he's not happy with us. Through sin, we have made ourselves our enemies, he says, and he means that. And until we are justified, there is no peace between us. But having been justified, we are guaranteed that there is peace between us and God now. In fact, we are on such good terms with God that Paul goes on to say in verse 2 that we can stand in his presence. It's easy to skip over that word. But there, if you go reading through the Old Testament, you don't see people standing in God's presence. So this is an amazing posture that Paul is describing about and people can do this, Paul is saying, even though they're still people who commit sins and break God's commands. By giving the gift of justification, people like you and me, people who still sin, can stand in God's presence. How is this possible? Well, Paul tells us in verse 2, he says, it's because through whom, that is through Jesus, we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. You see, grace is not just forgiveness of past sin. Grace is like a sphere or a space that we enter into and now live in presently because Jesus' death paid for all of our sins, the past ones, the present ones, and all the future ones. You see, it is good and right for us to approach God and express sorrow over our sins. That is a righteous thing and a good thing to do in his presence. And it is good, again, to ask God for our forgiveness when we have forgotten what a great gift that is. That is something we are called to do regularly. But the news of the gospel is that for those who have faith in Jesus' death on the cross, all of our sins are already forgiven by God on the basis of that faith, even if we ask for forgiveness over and over again. It's all been done already. So when we come and do confession on a Sunday morning, we're already forgiven before we ask. As it says in the letter to, to the Hebrews, Jesus' death was a sacrifice that covered all of our sin 
once for all. All our sin from beginning to end has been paid for in advance by Jesus and therefore all offense against God has been covered. Now, Paul will go on in chapter 6 to explain why this does not excuse our sin, why it's not okay for us to go sinning, and therefore why we can't go indulging in sin. But at this point here, he's trying to drive home his main point, which is that if you have faith in Jesus, God has nothing against you. Nothing against you, even when you break a command and fall short of what he is asking us to do. He is not angry at you for losing your temper last Tuesday. He is not disappointed in you because you haven't yet broken free from your addiction to alcohol or drugs or pornography or whatever other sinful behavior it might be. Because you are justified by faith in Jesus Christ, God feels nothing but love and compassion for you every moment of every day, even when you're failing. The gospel has given us peace with God. A peace that cannot be shaken for those who simply trust Jesus to save them even when they fail. A peace that lets us stand in God's presence without any shame or embarrassment or fear. Sinners though we are. More than rescuing us from wrath, justice, justification brings us peace with God by drawing us into his grace to that space and yet there is still more than this brothers and sisters for paul writes at the end of verse 2 of chapter 5 this he says and we rejoice or boast he says in the hope of the glory of god god's glory his weight his significance which is what that word means lie in his immortality and perfection We do not yet share in that immortality or perfection perfectly in any way. But Paul is saying that one day we will. As Paul is fond of saying elsewhere, one day we will be like Christ, who is the image of the invisible God. Therefore, justification not only secures freedom from God's wrath and peace with God, but the promise, the certain hope, that one day we will share in God's glory in the eternal life and moral perfection we see in the risen Jesus Christ. God's plan, then, in Christ, is more than a restoration project. Through faith in Christ, the promise is that God will make us into more than Adam and Eve ever were in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve did not get to eat from the tree of life, my brothers and sisters. They did not share in the glory of God. But you and I and every other person who simply believes will one day share in the eternal glory of the living God. Yes, we are sinners living in grace right now, but one day we will no longer sin. And right now we must still endure the trials and troubles of life, including the trial of death itself. But one day we will be raised into bodies that will never die. Our joy is not grounded in the pathetic hopes of this life the hope of making money or seizing a few moments of fame. Our joy is grounded in the hope of the glory of God in which we will share when Christ returns. And that is so much more than simply hoping for God to fix the bad news that we see around us today. The justification won for us by Jesus brings so much more good news. In fact, with Jesus, even the bad news becomes good news. This is Paul's next point in verse 3, where we read him right. Not only so, but we also rejoice or boast in our sufferings, literally tribulations, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. Sufferings, or more literally tribulations, or the troubles of life, that's what that word means, are still bad things. We are not told to rejoice because of our troubles, but to rejoice in our troubles. Why? Because for those who stand justified by the blood of Jesus, God's power is at work using the very troubles of life to transform our character, to make us into people more like Jesus Christ and thereby increase our hope. In other words, if you're hoping to be like Jesus, 
which is what you're hoping for if you're hoping for the glory of God, then having your character transformed more into the likeness of Jesus Christ here in this present time, even in small ways, is an amazing encouragement of hope. Why? Because it is a reason, uh, it is a reason, I should say, to remain steadfast to the promise of God that he who started the good work in you will be faithful to complete it because we can see, even in ourselves, undeniably that God has already started that work. Personal transformation is evidence of God's power and faithfulness in fulfilling his promise to make us like Christ, the promise of the glory of God. And God has taken our troubles, as awful as they truly are, and he has made them into events that lead to transformation if we are faithful to persevere in them. Therefore, there is even more good news. For those who believe even the troubles of life lead to good things, to the transforming of our character and therefore the strengthening of our hope in the glory of God. For the justified, even suffering has purpose. It has been put to good use by God, as bad as it is in and of itself. And yet there's still more good news. And here we arrive at the crown jewel of the gospel, the greatest of all the gifts given to us by God. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. Greater than the knowledge that we are saved from wrath and all the bad news of this world. Greater than the knowledge that we have peace with God. Greater than the knowledge that we will share in God's glory. Greater than the knowledge that our suffering has purpose is the gift of the presence of God himself, his Holy Spirit in our hearts. Why? Because all of those other things are indirect experiences of God. Things that our loving God has done for us out there in order to bless us. But the gift of the Holy Spirit is the gift of God having pouring out his love into our hearts directly and personally. It is him himself touching us. Apart from the Holy Spirit, God's love is indirect. But with the Holy Spirit, God is pouring out his love directly into us. And it is for this reason that the words of the gospel can sometimes sound hollow and empty without the Holy Spirit. But for everyone who believes in Jesus, Paul assures us that the Holy Spirit has been given to him and her and is at work pouring out God's love directly into your heart. You see, sermons take up a lot of time in worship services. Sorry about that. <laughs> but sermons, I want you to know, are not the most important part of worship. Not even close. Worship is the complete surrender of your whole life to God. And worship is met by God's free and often spontaneous further fillings with the spirit in which the worshiper directly experiences the love of God in his or her heart. It happens during prayer, it happens during singing praise, in serving the poor, in staying true to Jesus in difficult times, and sometimes even in sermons. But it is when the love of God is poured out into your heart by the Holy Spirit that everything I am preaching about will actually make sense in a way that goes far beyond what you can ever understand with your mind alone. For Christianity is not a philosophy even though it makes sense of life. Christianity is a relationship with the living God. And the living God came in Christ and died on the cross and justified all who believe for this purpose, that he himself may dwell in your heart and pour out his love for you. And this is what we doubt, isn't it? We doubt that God really is that in love with us, 
or that God really would come that close and intimate to us, to enter right into our very hearts. And so that is what Paul spends the whole rest of chapter 5 assuring us of. Listen again, starting in verse 6, where he writes, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's love is greater than any human, any human love that has ever been shown. A human might die for a good person. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, idolaters who wanted nothing to do with him and had exchanged him for a lie, while we were in this state, Christ died for us. And this is why Paul goes on in verses 9 and 10 to declare that if it is this greatest of all loves that is the motivation behind Jesus' death on the cross for us, then how much more there is, in fact, how much more there has to be to God's salvation than just saving us from the consequences of sin. His love is too great to stop there. So Paul declares, how much more shall we be saved through his life, through entering into a whole new way of living, into life in the Spirit? And if you doubt God's power and determination to do this for every single person who believes, including you, then simply do a compare and contrast between Adam and Jesus, which is exactly what Paul goes on to do in verses 12, verse 12 and following. In other words, if you want further proof of God's powerful love for you, then consider how much more powerful Christ's death, that single act of obedience, was than the single act of disobedience that Adam committed in the garden. We have to acknowledge that in a mysterious way that we can't explain, but that we can observe is most definitely true, after Adam sinned, all people sinned. Whether it was Adam's example, or something that was passed down biologically, or the result of Adam's position as the first human, people argue about all these kinds of things, Bible doesn't tell us. But while Paul expects us and his audience to agree on, is the fact that since Adam sinned, that one act has resulted in humankind's slavery to sin and therefore the penalty of death that comes with it. That's what history shows. But Paul then says in verse 15, but the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? In other words, God's grace His loving desire to freely justify us was more than enough to overcome sin and death. It overflowed all that. In fact, in verse 20, Paul goes on to say that even when the law was added, and this resulted in the trespass increasing, which I believe is a reference to what Paul referred to back in chapter 2, verse 24, where he pointed out that the coming of the law simply added the further sin of blasphemy to God's name to the sin that we've already committed, so it increased our trespassing. Paul is saying that even when our sin increased to the point that it served to ruin God's name, to destroy his reputation in other people's eyes, even when we did that to God, it did not stop God from loving us and freely giving us his grace. As Paul goes on to say in the second half of verse 20, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more so that Just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, no matter how much sin may increase, God's love for us is so great that his grace will always increase even more. In other words, human sin has not even tested the limits of God's love, not even close. Jesus' death was not just effective, It was super effective, much more than enough to cover every sin. Why? Because God's grace, his undeserved love for us, is not just abundant. It is super abundant. 
His grace reigns over, it conquers all the powers of sin and death for all who believe. So then how much more could God love you? There is no answer to that question because there is no limit to his love. He is not content just to propitiate, to simply save us from wrath. God is not content just to be at peace with us. He's not content to simply exalt us, to share in his glory, the very glory of God. Crazy amazing. He is not content to turn all our suffering into meaningful experiences of transformation. He is thrilled to do all of that for us, to give us all of these things, but his love for you is so great that he is not content with these things as amazing as they are. God loves you so much that he will settle for nothing less than pouring out his love for you personally, directly into your heart, himself, through his Holy Spirit. How much more can there be for us in this good news from God? There is no limit to the answer to that question. God will never cease to do everything necessary to show you his love directly himself in the very depths of your heart. In fact, he has already done everything necessary in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. All that remains for us is to believe, to trust, and receive. This is why God's news is so good. And it is also why we cannot really understand the gospel until after we put our faith in Christ alone and receive the free gift of God's Holy Spirit. You see, I can talk about the good news, but to really understand it, to really understand the good news, that only comes by experiencing the love of God poured out in your heart by the Holy Spirit when you believe. So my encouragement to you is to offer your whole self to God in worship. And he then, in his time and his way, will pour out his love into your heart. And that, my brothers and sisters, is the good news. Amen. Amen. Would you please bow in prayer with me? Heavenly Father, as we now prepare ourselves to do the uh, central signifying uh, act of obedience, the sign of faithfulness to you in taking communion. Heavenly Father, we offer this to you as an act of worship, an act of offering our whole selves to you. And we trust that in your ways and in your times, you will not only let us know the goodness of your love uh, by transforming our character, by eventually glorifying us with you in heaven, by all these other good gifts that you give to us, but that you yourself, by the power of your Holy Spirit, will pour your love into our hearts. And so, Heavenly Father, as we come to the table now, offering ourselves to you, we open ourselves to you and ask you to fulfill that promise that you would pour your love into our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name, who died for us when we were still sinners. Amen. So at this time, I invite you to come to the table. Oh, wait. And we're going to sing a hymn first, aren't we? <laughs> um, I want to get to the table. We're all going to get there, but we're going to sing a little bit first. So we're going to sim sing uh, hymn number 737, Like a River Glorious. So would you please stand with me? Thank you. 
And now at this time, I invite you, uh, wherever your table may be, to come to the table of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome. This table is not our table, nor is the one where you're sitting at either, at least not for the next few minutes. The table you are sitting in front of is now the table of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And anyone who believes in him is welcome to this table. For we remember that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread And after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you please bow with me now as we give thanks for the bread. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who offered himself, body and soul, on the cross, so that we might receive good news, not only deliverance from all of our troubles, but the presence of your Holy Spirit in us and the love of God, you, in our hearts. And so, Heavenly Father, at this time, by receiving this bread and this cup, we offer ourselves wholly to you and wait for you to touch our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us take this bread together in remembrance of him. In the same way, after the supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death and all that that signifies till he comes. You now bow with me as we give thanks to the cup. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that one great act of righteous obedience that your Son, Jesus Christ, culminated his whole ministry with. That when he gave his life and shed his blood on the cross, such incredible love and power was released to cover over all sin and to heal all brokenness. And so, Heavenly Father, as we take this cup, We signify our faith in that promise that by the shed blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, you are at work and will complete the complete healing of this world and to unite us in perfect relationship with you forevermore. For this we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us now take this cup together in remembrance of him. And now we will close by singing again the first verse of hymn number 737, Like a River Glorious. So this is verse 1. Yeah. 
now may you go as a people who have fully surrendered their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ and experience the pouring out of his love in your hearts by the Holy Spirit and accept all the other good news that comes with that too. In that peace, go forth and serve your Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.